Okay, so I'm happy to introduce uh, Cornelius from Southern Alabama. Um, he's going to talk today about the Humphreys Burma conjecture and Duncan's tilting module conjecture. Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for having me, getting me out of my kitchen. I'm on sabbatical and I'm going anywhere. So, anyway, so, so this talk will be. The first half of the talk will delve a little bit in the history of this problem, and the second half of the talk I will probably mention some some work that joint work with Chris Bendel and Arcano and Paul Scott. Don't blame them for the talk, okay? Blame them for the results. All right, I like it here behind the bulletproof glass. <laughs> Okay, so first, first, uh, some advertisement here. Uh, please uh, come down to Mobile, Alabama, and organize a special session at the fall southeastern meeting, sectional meeting of the AMS. Uh, hopefully, the first meeting that will be in person again is going to be November 2021 and 2021. And the hurricane season should be over, and the football team is out of town getting beat up somewhere else. So we should be we should be in good shape. Okay, so please consider uh, uh, you know, coming or organizing something. Right? Okay. Can, can everybody hear me? Can you hear me at home? Um, <laughs> I don't know if they want to hear me. Okay, so yeah, so I want to talk a little bit about the history of, of the so called Humphreys Burma conjecture and Tompkins conjectures. And so before I get into that, there, there are a few, a few bits of, of, of uh, <clears throat> notation that I want to get through. So G will always be a simple, simply connected algebraic root to the work of an algebraic closed field. And uh, most of the time, I will always talk about positive characteristic. Uh, so, for those not that familiar, just think about SLNK as an example, and later I will talk a little bit about the exception of Okay, then we have our usual Horace and Borel subgroups. Think about diagonal matrices, think about lower uh, triangular matrices. <clears throat> uh, I, I will not get too much into the root system, but of course, we always have a root system in the background here. And H is the so called coxeter of the group system. In the case of SLN, H is simply N. Six. This will play a role because you will see that when we do this kind of work, <clears throat> that there will be a nice uniform answer very often for the prime being large enough relative to the coxeter of the group system. Okay, so that's why this H kind of will play uh, an important role uh, sometimes. A little bit more, uh, we need some character and we need weights. Uh, so, so by X, I will simply denote the characters of the chorus and uh, so it's isomorphic simply to, to uh, integers uh, uh, with the rank of G, <coughs> uh, uh, dimension rank of G. The so called dominant weights are the ones that are non negative integers, and those are important because they are used to. Parameterize most of the representations that I will later come on. So the representations will be labeled by these n couples of non numbers. <clears throat> and uh, the x sub one, these are the so called p restricted weights. So these are simply the ones where all the components are between zero and p minus one, where p later will be the five that we're talking about. Characteristic zero, of course. Is the and a couple of times you will see up the, 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 the weight row will show up with the short for just one, 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 uh, the one that's also the, the about sum of the positive groups. Right? Okay, so um, most of us make a living teaching calculus, okay? And uh, well, when we teach calculus, we tell our students that we can approximate functions by tangent lines or tangent spaces. Okay, and so naively you can think about uh, you have an algebraic group that you can kind of approximate it uh, with, with the B algebra. Okay, it's just an easy picture here. So for, for capital SLN, the corresponding B algebra would just be lowercase SLN, matrices with trace zero, the usual traffic. If you're in characteristic zero, you just 
ignore the word restricted. Okay, and if you can find that accurate P, then you need to use our restricted PL trust that we're interested in. And because usually we would like the work with associative algebra class, we pass on to the enveloping or restricted, restricted enveloping algebra class. Okay, I don't really know those simply by you. Okay, so I'm kind of starting with the language that like Burma and countries were using in the 70s. Okay. All right, so so uh, we have this approximation of our group called the D algebra, and if we're in characteristic zero, uh, the underlying field are the complex numbers, then in some sense we actually get everything that we want to know. So if you're interested in finite dimensional rational representations, then you find everything by just studying the D algebra. So in some sense, in characteristic zero, it's okay if you're a flat or a now, of course, if you're in characteristic P, then this is no longer the case. So we get some data and some information from the Bianchi but we certainly don't get everything. Okay. And so from now on, I will pretty much concentrate on the positive characteristic. That's the All right. So what data can be recovered? Uh, so the first thing are the simple modules or Irreducible modules. And it goes back all the way to Charlie Curtis, who showed in 1960 already that if I take the simple modules of the algebraic group that, that uh, have their components less than or equal to T minus one, and I restrict them down to the Lie algebra, I get all the simple objects for the Lie algebra. Okay. <clears throat> and then there is the famous Steinberg Hansen product theorem. Which also tells me for the algebraic group, if I have a very dominant wave lambda and I write it in its periodic expansion, then Steinberg's Hansen product theorem kind of tells me what the irreducibles for the algebraic group look like. Okay, and the notation here is if I attach a one, an upper one, then that denotes that I take the, the, the vector space, but I twist the action with the Frobenius morphism. Okay, and the standard Frobenius morphism in the case of SLNK would be simply raising all the matrix entries to the key power. Very characteristic key that shows the standard morphism. Okay, so even so, there are infinitely many non isomorphic simple modules for the algebra group, and only finitely many for the B algebra. We still, in some sense, get the characters, dimension, etc., for the algebra group. Okay. So that's kind of like the good news. Um, <clears throat> okay, so in 1973, uh, Jim Humphreys and, and Verma were looking at the next kind of natural class of modules. Okay, so the restricted enveloping algebra is a finite dimensional algebra, it's a Hopf algebra. I mean, it's, 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 I will not talk about finite groups today, but if you're doing finite groups of these type, it's very similar kind of thing. I, mean, the whole, I, could, I could ask all these predictive questions also about the finite group, but I will concentrate on the So if you're doing finite dimensional algebras, then the next class of modules that we look at are, are the, the so called PIMs, the principal and decomposable. Right, which is which you can also think of as the objective powers of objective powers of the simple object. Okay. And so the question, the natural question that Humphrey and Verma were asking was like, well, you know, we can lift the simple things. Can we lift these pin songs of the algebra? Right? Okay, so that and, and sometimes in the literature it shows up as a question, but actually they kind of at least Humphreys made it a conjecture. Okay. Any questions on anything? Okay, let me tell you a couple of remarks. So, so Jim Humphreys was my advisor. And sadly, he passed away last year. And uh, he gave me a lot of problems. I mean, for my thesis. So, okay. <laughs> one of them was also this one. And I never made any progress. And uh, I'm not feeling so bad because for a long period of time, nobody else made any progress on this question. Uh, there are some programs actually which I will mention. Never mind. I will get to that in a minute. Um, 
Yeah, and Verma cost a million two thousand well, but and I stole this tip from Verma and he took it back in four movies. It's kind of the amateur photographer. So all right. Now the situation that they were looking at, they were looking at a very concrete situation when they when they were asking that question or question or making that check. So <clears throat> there's one very famous model, that's the Steinberg model. And again, those of you who do finite groups are also familiar with the Steinberg model. But if I take the largest restricted weight in some sense, the weight that has p minus one to be in each component, that's its own block. And so here the simple module and the pin are the same. Okay. And we call this module the Steinberg module. And it is projective and projective, and it's Right. And then there's, uh, I think, countries at the time of learning about op algebras. So, uh, you know, it's just general nonsense about op algebras, but if you deal with the tensor or something injective projective, then it remains in the Again, for groups, this was long time. Okay. And so they concrete had the following idea take the Steinberg module, tensor it with a simple module. Okay. And you want to pick the simple module that guarantees you that you get the L of lambda exactly once appearing in the circle, because then that guarantees that the pin the Q of lambda will appear exactly once as a summit. Okay, so this lambda tilde is this kind of weight here that is exactly the right way to, to use to get this. Okay, omega zero is the longest element of the line. Okay. So, so the skew of lambda appears exactly once as a sum end. And so now we're already kind of stepping in the right direction because the Steinberg tensor of the irreducible, that of course can be lifted to the algebraic group, right? So now the question is, how does this thing decompose? Does it decompose similarly for the B algebra as it decomposes for the algebraic group? So that's what the question is. And that was kind of the concrete situation that they were, were thinking of when they were asking this. Right. Okay. So now, when we're when we as we moved into the eighties period of big hair, we also kind of switched a little bit the way we looked at things. Like Humphreys and Verma and Janssen in the early days were working with hyper algebras or distribution algebras. We kind of started using the language of the Frobenius curve. Okay. So G sub R will denote the the R Frobenius curl. And for example, the coordinate algebra of KG1, the, the, the coordinate algebra KG1 on the Aristophanes problem, that is the rule of the restricted development model. So, in that language, we were kind of these days we're talking about the Aristophanes problem as well, which has the same algebra. And we do one more trick here. Um, because if you're working with P algebras, there's no maximal weight or something like that. So, in order to keep and a track of the weight uh, information, we, we also throw in the torus and we use the full bag of the torus. So the first one will be no Okay, so that gives us a little bit more information. All right. Okay, so now here comes uh, the big slide. Um, well, if, if you're doing you're drawing representation theory of algebraic groups, then the first thing is that you have injective objects of the infinite dimensional, and you have no projective objects at all. Okay, but here is a very nice category to work with, and these are the so called truncated categories. So I will stick with a very simple example, just take a dominant weight lambda, and I will denote by mod lambda. A category of all finite dimensional rational P modules whose weights are less than or equal to lambda. Okay. Uh, and this category has injectives and projectives, and it's a very prominent category. It's used in many, many different areas. The Shure algebras arise this way. And like that. So, um, <clears throat> so I'll, I'll fix a lambda, and then this is kind of pillar notation. That I will denote by P sub lambda mu. I will denote the projective cover of L of u in the category one. Of course, assuming mu is less than. Okay. 
and I, the I sub lambda mu will be the objective. Okay. Now, the first easy example is take P lambda lambda. Okay, so we're looking, and then of course, what you get is the classical highest weight module or the Y module. Okay, which, which are very nice modules because uh, these are exactly the objects that are simple and characteristic zero. And you have Lorentz character formula with all the dimensions and the character is easy to calculate. Okay, and similarly, uh, I, I can do the I lambda lambda and get so called so this module. And those people who kind of use, I mean, in the language of highest weight categories, you will call them standard and co standard populations. Okay. Now, if I take an arbitrary protective here, or an arbitrary weight in my category, then it will not be uh, the viable module, but it will always have the filtration of viable modules. And similarly, the injectives in this non weighted category will always have a filtration with these induced modules, which we will call good filtration. Okay. Uh, and there's some duality here also. There's not direct duality. You kind of have to take the dual of the of the weights also. But um, that's the that's the setup here. All right. So here's a very beautiful answer. And that answer was around before Humphrey was asking me this question. Okay. So there's a very beautiful answer that, that uh, is, is due. The final answer, so to speak, is due to Janssen around 1980, even so he didn't exactly formulate it this way. But if the prime is large enough, meaning at least 2h minus 2h is a positive number, then it turns out that these few of lambdas can be lifted. They can be lifted uniquely. And not only can they be lifted, but they are exactly these injective and projective objects in this truncated category. Okay, so this this is a is a very very um, a nice answer. And then notice also besides the lambda tilde, I now also have a lambda cat. I remember this queue of lambda was showing up in the tensor product Steinberg tensor Howard tilde. So that's where this highest weight here comes. Right, so that's just the, the proper way to use. Okay. Uh, so very beautiful answer. Okay. Now uh, the problem is the there are fails of smaller primes in general. It fails really miserable for primes that are like small but not too small. Okay. If p is greater than or equal to h, then those of you who are familiar, then, then we have p regular weights. So there's something in the alcoves, then it really fails miserably. Okay, uh, it's completely wrong. And if the prime is really small, then there are some sporadic cases where it still works, but in general, it also fails. The sporadic cases is because you know, if the prime is really small, then there are very few simple objects in the linkage classes, and so there sometimes it just works. But in general, this, this fails miserably uh, for, for small primes. So that was the question that Humphreys was asking at that time. So this was already Janssen's answer was well known. All right. Oh yeah, let me let me let me go back one more time. Notice now that the U of lambda is equal to the I and to the P. The P has a vial filtration, the I has a good filtration. Meaning that the eyes of the P's and the lift of the Q's have both a good filtration and a wild filtration. Yeah. Okay. And I'm pretty sure that was the motivation for, for Duncan's work later on in 1990. Uh, Duncan, uh, based on work by Ringel, introduced the tilting modules to the algebraic. So if we say that a, that a module B is a tilting module if it admits. Both the good and the wild filtration. Okay, so these P's and Q's and Young's set up exactly have that. They're exactly good. All right, and so this is exactly now we get one more player in here. P is bigger than 2H minus 2. Then not only do I have the I's and the P's and the Q's, I can also introduce the tilting modules. Okay, and so there's another class of modules that's also isomorphic. Okay. 
And there's a very important theorem here uh, due to one Duncan and finally Mercure that the tensor product is considered to be a Actually, here there's a tensor product of two modules in a good compression. All right, so now I have the tilting modules coming in. And so if P is greater than 2H minus 2, all of these guys are the same. Well, what do I do if the prime is less than that? The i's and the p's are no longer used, so let's just throw them out. And so Duncan's conjecture in 1990 was that the, the q of lambda is still equal to the one point. But we really have to throw out the q's and the i's, they will no longer uh, be possible. Okay. Uh, let me go back to, to, to the way that Humphreys and Verma were looking at. They were looking at these tensor products, Steinberg tensor L of lambda tilde. Okay. And, and, and uh, as a G1 T summit, the Q of lambda would be the G1 T summit that contains the unique hardest way. And this is where well, the story also gets a little bit personal. So Humphreys gave me this problem and I, I played around with it. I didn't know anything about tilting modules. They were, but then Steve Duncan actually came to you UMass for me to visit Humphreys. He told me about tilting modules, and he told me like it would be really nice if, if I would look at this tensor product and the tilting module would show up. And so, so my epsilon contribution here was I could actually show him that the largest sum and the largest G sum and of the other side group that appears is actually the tilting one. Okay. So now the question is basically this guy, is it is it really proposable if I reduce it down to the real Or you can also say, does it have a simple cycle as a G module difference for compression? Okay. And are there any questions or anything? I shut my phone off, so I have no idea what I'm doing time wise. Oh, there's a clock right there. All right. Um, okay, so since 1990, like uh, various people had done things, but no one really got anywhere an answer to this. Like I said, I didn't get anything, but I didn't feel so bad because nobody else seemed to get anywhere. So, okay. And then in, in 2019, we actually found a counterexample to Duncan's subject. And maybe it wasn't as surprising that we found the counter example, but what's surprising was that we found the counter example for rank two. Okay, that was kind of surprising. So if the prime is equal to two and the group is of type E2, then then Duncan's contacted those. So there's an example of, of a tilting module that, that does that does uh, decompose further if I reduce it down to the to the uh, Okay. And since then we've, we've played around with things and we found more, we found more counter examples of type B and of type B2. And we also found, um, and, and I don't know, maybe two is special, but we also found at least one example right now for two equals three. Okay, so there are more counter examples out there. Okay, and I will talk a little bit more about that, about that later. Um, all right, so these are kind of negative answers. Uh, let me also say something. Technically, technically the humphreys verma conjecture has not been disproved, but the spirit of the humphreys verma conjecture that the sum end in this tensor product it could be written, that has been disproved also. Okay, but it could be that it still shows up as some kind of sub quotient of some module. But, uh, all right, so here's a positive answer. Uh, we just looked at, at small rank groups, and uh, if you take type n, so SLN, well, SLN plus one, I guess, okay, then uh, up to rank three, uh, the tilting the, module conjecture holds, for G2 it holds, and for G2 it holds for all other primes, and for P equals two, of course, we can't be out of the Okay. So here, here's a positive 
uh, here's a positive answer to, to this question. Okay. Um, all right. Let me maybe discuss one case here a little bit. Uh, and that's the other way to move this to for all right now. I don't know. I, I really don't know. Um, I did, if, if I would want to bet, I would say AN is probably the, the best bet that it might hold. Okay. Because, uh, but I don't know. I mean, it's really, it, it's really difficult, uh, a difficult question. Um, in particular, because, like I said, you saw it earlier, and uh, when I mentioned when I read Janssen, if, if the prime is like between H and 2H, it's very different setup than if the prime is less than H. Okay, so I don't know, but if there's any chance of the printing with this conjecture holding, I would say maybe in part A. But that's the only that's one where we have to talk about any part of the time. And again, there are, there are, I have feelings, okay, but I can't I can't tell you any real rational reason. Yeah, we, we might be able to, to find how they come with the other type. And it, it, you know, it, the reason could be as simple as for A and all the fundamental weights are minuscule. That might be something that has something to do with it. Okay, but I, I, it's really hard to say. I think one problem here is that there just aren't enough examples that have been calculated because it gets very, very difficult to calculate. All right, so let's talk a little bit about G2, the rank two group. Uh, alpha will be the short root, beta will be the long root. And um, <clears throat> I still don't want to put that somewhere. Okay, and I want to look particularly at the case equal three. And because P equal three, there's a very special thing going on here. It's one of those where we have another special isogeny. It's kind of like half of Robinius curl. Okay, so there's a special isogeny. This only happens for, for P equal three and type P two. It also happens for P for types B and C and P equals two and for F4 for P equals two. So this is a very special thing. Steinberg was looking at these things. Uh, quite a while ago. So we kind of have a, we have this sigma that's kind of like half of the previous curve. So the sigma square is like the ordinary, or, sorry, uh, the Frobenius map. So the sigma square is like the ordinary Frobenius map. So I will call this thing G1 half. Okay. So by, by G1 half, I will denote that, that this scheme theoretic kernel of this half Frobenius map. And I should also point out, yeah, this these things arise if, if you do classification of finite simple groups in the so called V groups of type G2. They show up as the fixed points of, of powers of this special half of these. Okay, so that, that's also where they play a lot. Okay. <clears throat> and if, if, if you look at the if you look at the uh, uh, orbit algebra, then this is exactly the dual of the restricted and developing algebra having just the short roots. There are three short roots and uh, sorry, yeah, three short roots and three long roots. Okay. And I will denote in, in the spirit of, of the Frobenius twist, I, I will denote a module that has been twisted to sigma by, by lifting it just the one time. Okay. So if, if, if you lift by one half and another one half, then you get the ordinary. Okay, so this is a very special situation. And, and, and so what's, what's very nice here is now my, my sigma restricted weights, I just have three weights, the trivial omega one and two omega one. And the, the, the L of two zero and the L of two omega one times plays the role of the Steinberg one. Okay, kind of like a house type, I will denote it by Steinberg one half. Okay, and so if, if I twist L of one zero, then I get L of zero one, and if I twist L of zero one one more time, then I get L of one zero twisted one, same as L of three zero. So it's kind of a generalization of the Steinberg one. 
So in particular, you can re you can rewrite all the simple modules as tensor products in this okay. And now we, we just play the same game. So so now let's let's introduce pins. Let's introduce injective modes and projective covers that will denote the point of view on half. Okay. And and so these 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 will be the cues for these half Robinus curls. Okay, and then one one can actually show. So Janssen's approach would not work here, okay? But if we work with the half of this kernel instead of the entire of this kernel, then this Janssen type of approach actually works. So the filling modules that, that have these highest weights, right? They would have to be now of the form two zero plus sigma restricted weight, right? Because they could be a two zero, two zero, four zero. They are all injective and projective in the truncated category. So by going down to the half of this kernel, in some sense, you can copy Janssen's approach. Okay, and then uh, you can also write the ordinary uh, uh, pin for the first of this kernel. There's the Steinberg type tensor product theorem available also for the most books. And so this kind of thing rescues us here, and and so you can kind of write the Q1. Tensor product of these types, and I'm, I'm sweeping a little bit of stuff onto the table here, but, it, but it's not too hard to convince yourself that you can also lift the Q1s, and they're exactly the tensor modules that you have. Okay, so the Duncan's conjecture will hold the Q3, which is maybe also interesting because when we first talked about this, people were asking about well, something about bad times, and the Q3 of course is also bad here, but the Q3 actually Duncan. Okay. But you can see already we're using something very special. You cannot generalize this one. Yeah. Okay, or even the other five. So that's one. Yeah, so that's one. Just one example of how you can deal with these cases. And it's in some sense very cute with this. It's, uh, it's hard for me to stop it. All right. So I kind of showed you one technique. Kind of working in front data categories working with vectors and projectors. So here's another technique that, that you can use. And for that, I first have to introduce a, a, a little bit more of, of notation. So for, for a dominate, uh, for a dominant weight lambda, I, I kind of take the first step or the attic <laughs> decomposition, right? And there's something restricted plus. The rest of it, and then I'm going to introduce these uh, NABLA P comma R. These are going to be the simple modules twisted with the induced module twisted R time. And it's sorry, tensor with the induced module twisted R time. Okay, and and similarly, I, I do something like that for, for the delta, which are the wild and the wild time. So here is something that Okay, so I talked about you want to study algebraic groups. You can use the V algebra here in the range. Now, there are also quantum groups, right? Quantum groups are the group of unity, which also mimic a lot of the uh, 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 what's going on in characteristic P. Okay, now the problem is like if I look through quantum groups, then all of these guys will also be simple ones. Well, the quantum group this would not be very interesting because if I, if I twist one since it's repeated from the quantum group, I get a semi simple uh, category. Okay, so this is very different in category P, and, and this can cause a lot of headaches, as you will see in a few minutes. So we say now that a G module has a good PR filtration if it has a filtration with these kinds of uh, factors. Okay, and similarly, we say that uh, a, a G module has a, uh, what do I call it, vital P or P vial, a vital PR filtration if it has a, a, a uh, filtration with, with factors of this. Okay. Um, and sometimes I will just refer to it as a good P filtration or a Q filtration if it's hard. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, one one observation here, I think this was first proved in general by Anderson. If, if for my lambda zero, I would put in the, the Steinberg weight, 
Okay, that actually then actually the the Napa itself decomposes. So that's one simple example, right? So, so the ordinary Napa of this way would have such. Okay, just one example. Um, this comes from. All right, so at the same conference in 1990, Larkin made uh, another conjecture, and this conjecture involves ECTR rotation. Okay, and he made the following conjecture M of finite dimension G module, that M has a good PR filtration if and only if the tensor product of Steinberg with M has a good filtration. I'm being a little bit loose here, I write R Steinberg, but but everything can be reduced to the first uh, uh, first position. Okay. Uh, now, um, earlier Janssen had kind of observed that, that this very often was the case, and he was asking the question: If I just take an ordinary deduced module, okay. Now, from the theorem of one one in of pure, we know if I tensor this with the Steinberg module, again, I get something that has a good filtration. So, so if Duncan's contact is correct, then every induced module would have to have substitution. Yeah? Okay. Um, and, and that was a question that Jansen asked. In some sense, it, it, it's again one of these things. If, if the weight is very small, then that's always the case. And if Weight is large and away from the wall, that's always the case, but there are some regions in between where that is uh, not the case. Okay. Now, let me also point out that our counter example to the building module conjecture also provides a negative answer to Janssen's question. So, um, there, is, there is some obvious connection. I mean, there's a reason why Duncan made those two conjectures at the same time because he, was, he had some thoughts. Okay. So here is the, another technique that can be used to verify the filter module conjecture. And this is based on the work by Gilbert of Pano and of Sudachi. It basically says the following. I take it, if I can prove that the Steinberg module tensor a simple module whose weight is in the restricted region as a good filtration, and I can prove that the nabla of lambda hat. Now, remember these lambda hats were like Steinberg weight plus a restricted weight. If I can prove that these have good filtration, then this would this would imply the filtration. Sorry? Good P filtration. Yeah, I'm sorry. Good P filtration. Okay, then that would that would imply the filtration. And so even even uh, uh, Duncan had made those conjectures together, and he was probably thinking along those lines. It was actually Paul Sudachi who finally noticed this Okay, and the first statement actually, the first condition is, is, is equivalent to one direction, the left to right direction of Duncan's conjecture, and the second one is a, is a special case of the right. Okay, so you can also say that Duncan's PR conjecture would imply. Okay, so that's the, that's the situation. Yeah. All right. Now, there are some answers of this question. So, Parshall and Scott have proved that in the positive answer to Janssen's question, that the prime has to be at least 2h minus 2 and the risky conjecture has to hold. Anderson got rid of the Lustig conjecture, but his, his P has to be bigger than H minus two times H. So for us, this doesn't work, right? Because we are looking at primes that are less than two H minus two. But this is kind of like a generic picture, right? Okay, so how do you prove how do you prove that the module that, that the module has a good in particular, we are interested in one, one special class of modules, namely the induced module. So we are really concentrating on Janssen's question. Okay. And so what we're doing is we're using the so-called baby Burmans. Uh, so instead of inducing from E all the way to the other side in G, we first induce from E to G1 B up to the first penis curl. Okay, and then we, we, we induce further. And so 
so these guys, these guys here are sometimes called the baby drummers. And I'm, I'm using the Janssen book notation, which has lots of dashes and caps. So now, so I, this is the module for the first convenience kernel. Now, of course, it, it has a filtration of simple objects, right? Okay. And what are the simple objects? Well, the simple objects are restricted representation, but then remember, we're also keeping track of the weights, keeping track of the chorus. So we get something simple and restricted, tensor or some weights. Okay, so I'm not just and so the question now is, uh, of course, when I do the induction, I could do the induction with each of these factors, right? And maybe I get some induction. Okay. And so basically, I don't want to go into too much detail here, is but but we will get a good filtration unless something like this happens. So first of all, we have to have two factors that have the same restricted part. And one of the factors, the first uh, R1, the first derived counter, has to be non-zero. Okay. And, and, and then we need to have a non-zero homomorphism between the induced module of the other counter. So that should be non-zero, but it should also not be an isomorphism. Because if we have an isomorphism that somehow two guys get cleanly killed and we don't have to. But the failure will happen if we have something that only a key step. Okay. And if I go to P greater than 2H minus 2 and I look at the modules that I'm interested in, then trivially, uh, 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 these guys will all be simple, but so that it's nothing bad can happen. Okay. But if the prime is smaller, then bad things can happen. And this is again where the picture is very different from the quantum group, where the quantum group, nothing bad can happen. Okay. So this is so I call this like bad cancellation. This is my so this is this is our worry, right? And so um here, here is the other case that I wanted to give you, which was the hardest case to deal with, and that is take the group C2 and take P equals seven. Okay, so seven is uh, seven is larger than the Coxeter number, okay, but it's less than two H minus two. So actually, uh, what we have here is that each alcohol will have exactly one irregular weight. Okay. Now, what comes to the rescue for us here, the methods that we can use is first of all that the holistic conjecture holds here. And this holistic conjecture for the first for the genius kernel, not for the other side. Okay, because the problem is when we have P equals seven and in the modules we are interested in, we're, we're, we're dealing with E squared alcohol. So there's no hope to kind of work with the algebraic group directly. Okay, so we need to look at the, the G2, G1P version of the Lustig conjecture. And Janssen, a long time ago, calculated the characters because essentially I think it follows from the fact that, that all the induced modules in the restricted region are multiplicity. Have, have only one, but have only composition factors of multiplicity one, and that essentially implies that the Lustig conjecture is only one. So we, so we need the Lustig conjecture. Then George Lustig in 1980 introduced what we call the inverse Hirschstein Lustig polynomials, and not only did he introduce them, but lucky for us, he actually calculated them. For okay. And then in 1989, Anders and Kaneda wrote a paper that they kind of uh, they used ideas from John Irving, and they showed that that if the Lustig conjecture holds here, then, they, then these baby Vermars, uh, well, they have a radical filtration, and they showed, for example, that the baby Vermars are rigid, and they also showed that. There's an explicit formula how I can actually calculate the layers in the radical filtration using the Okay. And uh, and using all of this data, we were able to prove that that the kind of bad cancellation will not happen. Okay, because what we could do now is we could calculate the filtration and we could see where where these bad guys appear in the 
equation is always turned out that we kind of give them the right order. And we have to look at and look at detail and very often at some B modules and study them to show that the nodes are expanding in this form. Okay, but so, so we were able to, to rule this out. Now, uh, just to give you some idea, uh, here, here, here is one picture of Lustig's paper. Uh, uh, these are the polynomials. I don't know if he calculated them himself or if he had some solving writing scheme doing for him. I don't know, but these things appear in the paper. Uh, these are the actual polynomials. Here, here, here is a handwritten version that, that, that uh, Lustig has given me at some point. Uh, I added the coffee stain to some scribbles. Okay. But, uh, you know, there, there are 12 different alcoves, so there are 12 pictures like that that you have to look at. And here is kind of one example. If I take the verb, so the first column here would give you the baby verb on with uh, weight zero, 00. All of them have 129 composition factors. Okay. And again, there are 12 different alcoves for us to, to consider here. So you, you can see the complexity of the calculation is quite, uh, quite something. But we were able to actually explicitly calculate these things and give the rule out of the exact calculation. Okay. So this might be the technique to deal with when you're, I mean, there's some people, some people think that maybe Dawkins conjecture holds that P is greater than the crux of the number. And this might be one technique to kind of get it. And you cannot expect the Lusty conjecture to always hold, but then you can still say something how these factors appear in the book. Okay. All right, I think I've said enough. Yeah, yeah. Can you say how how it fell in those Well, so so if, if you're bigger if you're bigger than age, then you have things inside each of the alcoves, right? Okay, and it's just the weight the weights that you're looking at. If you're between age and two age roughly, then you could have something in the lowest alcove and something in the alcove above. They they could be very close. Right. Okay. And, and then what happens when you truncate the thing that's above is still in the category. P times the thing above is still in the category. So you can actually attach. But when you look at the injective and the even if the even if the tilting module objective is old, it would not be the injective module. You could attach other modules that are not here. Okay. So, so, so that will definitely fail. Right? The, the thing is, kind of, that this p being bigger than two h minus two, basically, has something to do that that the p times the things that go up are inside the lowest outflow, and everything is kind of semi-simple. That's why things kind of work there. But as soon as you uh, let it relax and you get extensions between things that are very close, okay, and, and you want to so there I have there the advantage there the fails for sure. If, if you look at really small times like two or three, you might sometimes be lucky, but there just isn't anything that stands you know. That character is actually Is that not so long like days? No, that will also go wrong in one No, 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 but this will, no, yeah, no, that's not an argument. Yeah. I mean, that will, that will just go wrong. Uh, uh, yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, for the, for the V2, first of all, uh, actually, Anderson in his recent paper, he actually showed that all the all the induced modules for time V2 always have a good P integration. And we had proved earlier that the Steinberg tensor something restricted always has a good P integration, so it follows from that. I mean, asking me a question, um, I think, I think when P is equal to no, I don't remember. I, I don't remember which page, but what's both. So the, the primes of interest are only T3 and I. Now I don't remember in my head. For some of them, we could use the Janssen approach, which would characterize them as injective and projective on those categories. And for the other ones, it was very easy to show that the ones of interest are or have a so it was a mixture of two things, but it's relatively A3 is already quite interesting. Uh, if you agree that the project is uh, so obviously G2, that was Jim Hampton and Brian Tyler came to him and told him something he said, oh, this is a Yeah, previously it really didn't work yet. Yeah. I mean, the problem is uh, it's just very hard to calculate the problem. So even, like, you know, that I don't know, some of you might know there's a program that's totally even can calculate composition factors and subtotal structures, but, you know, at the time you can just click on the rank. And it also gives wrong answers of time. This is It's very hard to calculate the thing. You haven't seen enough examples. I think that's part of the thing. So in some sense, I'm feeling I'm getting a little bit of an idea of what the reason would be why we feel in certain cases. But I certainly can. That's something we should talk about. Is there any questions on that? Oh, there are questions. I need to look at this or? John? John, do you have a question? John, do you have a question? John, do you have a question? No. <laughs> <laughs>